Welcome to Crescent City Crime, dear listeners. I'm Tracy. And I'm Brian. And I just want to let everybody know right off at the top, I'm not turning my fan off. If you hear the noise in the background, just live with it. It's kind of soothing. But you'll probably hear us mostly anyhow. Yeah, we, I did. Uh, I just did a recording for a local radio show called The Week in Geek, which is on uh, 99.5 WRNO in the New Orleans area, 99.5. Um, and the uh, the fan really didn't show up in my in my little recording. That's because you talk louder than the fan. <laughs> so that's our key: is to talk louder than the fan. Yep. Which I think we can easily do, even at normal volume. Yeah. So if anyone wants to hear some of my little mini skits, radio skits that I've done uh, for uh, local talk, local radio, uh, We Can Geek is available on Spotify and iHeartRadio. Uh, yeah, iHeartRadio right, yeah. on other podcast platforms. Uh, Sunday's episode in particular had I think two or two or three of my little radio skits on there. Yes, Brian, you you do love to perform. Oh, yes, it was quite fun. (laughs) It is quite, yes, it is. All right, so everybody, you all know the drill. We're on all the social medias. We're on all the podcasting platforms. We're on the, we are even on YouTube. So, please, follow us, like us, make a comment, whatever moves you. But... Word of mouth is always so important. We do appreciate you telling a friend, but also... Tell your enemies, especially your enemies. And you can also let your enemies know that you can see me for about two or three seconds in the movie Renfield, streamable on Peacock, okay? Uh, As well as available uh, at most stores in Blu-ray or, uh, you know, DVD, DVD of all the things I did in the movie... The movie Renfield, the Nicolas Cage vampire, Dracula comedy. It's very funny. Yeah, filmed in New Orleans. Very hilarious. Where I actually showed up is the, uh, my little featured bit as the uh, drunken tourist at the Lucky Dog Cart, where I'm wearing a blue shirt at the Café Du Monde. Uh, the scene that's supposed to be set at Café Du Monde. But it's um, not really Café Du Monde. It's a fake Café Du Monde. Built for yeah, the they, they set it up at the top of the moonwalk with these parasols. And Café Du Monde doesn't have parasols. They have this big overhang. But they wouldn't actually let let, let the crew film uh, at the actual Café Du Monde. It, so it would prob- fake probably be impossible. I mean, every time we pass Café Du Monde during peak hours, that line's down the street. It, yeah, I think it's just impossible for them to shut down for filming for that long. It was probably the more affordable option for the production for the production as well. Because I believe that the production would be paying Cafe Dumont for the lost business, right? Yeah, what probably would have been more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So they got to use, you know, Cafe Dumont mugs and uh, you know, fill up these bags with um well, grab a bunch of Cafe Dumont bags and fluff them out and make them look like there's beignets inside them, you know, for the scene, all that type of stuff. Uh, so I'm at the Lucky Dog cart wearing a blue shirt, and they paid Lucky Dog for catering. So uh, myself and other people, I got to eat three Lucky Dogs that day, and it's the only time I've ever eaten a Lucky Dog. It's, it's essentially, it's drunken tourist food. It's, I mean, they're okay hot dogs, you know. But you for like six bucks, I guess if you're a drunken tourist, you can't beat a Lucky Dog. So I'm wearing a blue shirt next to the cart. And I can be seen in back of Aquafina for about three seconds in that scene. Yeah, I love Aquafina. Oh yeah, she was hilarious in that movie, and was, I mean, it was it was uh, you know such an honor to meet her. Yeah. On on that set, uh, unfortunately, I did not get to meet Nicolas Cage because I wasn't involved with any of the filming that involved Nicolas Cage whatsoever. I. That's primarily first unit. I was mostly working with the second unit. I hope that uh, this is signaling mm-hmm. a come back for Nicolas Cage. I mean, he's actually been a friend to the city. He uh, Part of the reason why he went bankrupt was because he was trying to raise money for Hurricane Katrina uh, uh, charity work. Not to mention he also overextended himself. Yeah, he overextended himself, but he had... That, what was it, that movie of uh, The un- Unbearable... The one with Pedro Pascal? What was it, that see. movie? Uh, uh, something... Um, 
It's the all... unbearable weight of massive talents. Yeah, that's it. I believe, yes. I, believe it, I believe it was. And I remember I surprised you with that movie. You didn't know what you were taking, when I, what you were going to see. I told you it's a surprise. You love it because I was able to get passes for an advanced screening of that movie in, in New Orleans. Uh, Elmwood area, ironically, about a quarter mile away from the sound stages in the Elmwood area. Uh, yeah, another great Nicolas Cage movie that was like really hilarious. And of course, Star Wars fans, uh, you know, you'll love seeing Pedro Pascal and uh, his comedy and his, his comic chemistry with Nicolas Cage was amazing. Yes, so between that movie and Renfield, I hope that this is a a comeback for him because you know for a long time he was just taking any role that he could get and he was working on some some pretty bad movies and you know there are a lot of them are on streaming so you can go witness the awfulness of them you know reminders that for I mean for most actors it's all work mm -hmm. you know actually very few actors can be selective about what they do okay because you know, just like and just like a lot of other people, you have to work, right? You know, so Nicolas Cage had to work, so he took yeah he took a lot of stuff that um, where he is in his career he might not have otherwise taken, but he really needed the money, and he he might be caught up by now because he's actually doing some better stuff, which it, which is good because the unbearable weight of massive talent and Renfield are well worth watching. And they're gems, especially for Nicolas Cage fans. Yes, yeah, and I, like I said, I'm just very glad to see that he's making a comeback. It's not as, you know, kind of like uh, Robert Downey Jr., who I also very much enjoy. He was able to make a nice comeback uh, pretty much after overdosing. I, I think he almost died, but, you know, now, now look at him. Yeah, his comeback was was just so good that he's established a completely new identity in Hollywood. Yeah, and good for him. Yeah, well done. Yes, well done. So, last episode, we started to talk about Derek Codley. That was part one. And now we're going into part two. So, we did talk a bit about... Last week, we talked about how... Derek Todd Lee was initially not suspected because they believed that the killer was a white man. But DNA was really the star of this particular investigation. It was... So they thought, oh, they said white man aged 25 to 35, but close analysis of the DNA concluded that the Baton Rouge serial killer had about 80% African affiliation and about 15% Native American affiliation. So, in other words, the killer was not a white person at all. No. Um, and in, in, the, in southern Louisiana, also not unusual for someone to have Native American DNA and African American DNA as well. And someone who has those DNAs very likely has some French DNA too. Right. Mixed, mixed in. But what's even more frustrating is that there were clues that were already pointing in the right direction. Just after the murder of Charlotte Murray Pace in June of 2002, two witnesses said that they told authorities they saw a black man watching Charlotte's house on the day of the killing. So, you know, just a, a lead that they literally handed to police and the police dropped the ball entirely. One witness and her neighbors even made a composite sketch of their own, and it bore some, some resemblance to Lee. They circulated it on their own while police pursued potential white male suspects. And what do you have to know? Isn't that frustrating? Yes. It's very, yes, yeah. Cer cer certainly is. Uh, you know, a few concerned kid as citizens having to deal with Keystone cops. And the police kept saying that the killings could not be the work of an African-American man because, and this is a quote, all right, these are not my own words, this is something that a witness, her name was Karen Savoy, said that they felt this would not be a black person because it was a very messy crime and that blacks don't have a tendency to commit that violent or messy of a crime. Do you, do you believe that, Malarkey? <laughs> What? 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm I'm not so sure that um, OCD is indigenous to any particular race. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, but it it's just also it's it's both nonsensical and dismissive. Yeah, that All that right. doesn't that doesn't make any sense. It you know, does not make just, any sense. I, I mean, and the, the, the what question begs to be asked: Okay, where are you getting this from? Yeah, I, I don't know where they got it from, and. You know, killers, ser- serial serial killers have patterns. Okay, it that is had that has been established, but those patterns are on a wide spectrum. It could be a lot of things. It could be the method in which they gain access to their victims. It could be the what they've taken from their houses. It could be, um, you know, maybe. They, um, you know, the the way in which they kill their victims. It, there's just so many different ways that that they can go on this because they're humans. They're still human beings, and human beings in general we like patterns. Okay, so and there's a lot of patterns in life. There's a lot that you can identify. You can even create your own patterns, right? So it it's just so broad. Yes. Yeah. It's it cer- it certainly is. Um, yeah, there, there's there's no particular set pattern that every serial killer follows. Right. No, they they each, you know, every, every time it's a, you know, psychotic narcissist who wants to do their own thing. So they're going to have each have a different routine. Exactly, and in two thousand three. The task force collected hundreds of DNA samples. People were voluntarily giving samples just to be eliminated. The forensic evidence pointed to a single killer, but in spite of those hundreds of samples, the police had no match of this DNA profile to any that was electronically filed in in, uh, the databases maintained on local, state, and national levels. So he himself... The one profile that they were actually looking for was not logged anywhere. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's. And of course, not not everyone's DNA is going to be on file, especially. Especially in two thousand three. This is twenty years ago. Yeah. Now I know I do know that the military started collecting DNA from its service members during the nineties, mm. mid nineties. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Okay. But on May the fifth of two thousand three. And this was independent of the task force. The Zachary Police Department and the Louisiana Attorney General's Office worked together on the unsolved 1992 murder of Connie Warner and the disappearance of Randy Meebauer on April 27, 1999. Because of this, they were able to obtain a subpoena to obtain DNA buccal swabbings from Derek Todley. Pursuant to the subpoena, the police located it him at his home obtained those two DNA swabbings and then this evidence was logged into the evidence at the Zachary Police Department. Then on the very next day the police department delivered those swabbings to the crime lab and 14 days later the sample was tested. When the sample that was taken from the body of Carrie Lynn Yoder matched Derek Todley's The St. Martin Sheriff's Office called Diane Alexander to review the sketch that was first produced from the description of her assailant. That same day, law enforcement broadcasted on the day of the attack that the the, the sketch, and I'm sorry, that, that same day law enforcement broadcasted the sketch and described the gold car with the dented hood that Diane's son Herman had seen on the day of the attack. The task force began receiving calls almost immediately after publication of that information. So that's our timeline for how it finally, the case finally broke open. Okay, when they were able to get the sample between the description and and all of these little pieces of evidence, it finally presents a clear picture. 
Yeah. Now, how about that trash? When yeah, how about that? When you actually, you know, do your job? Yes, how about that? In the following days, Diane was shown a photo lineup, and she immediately picked Derek Todd Lee's photo. And on May the 26th, 2003, law enforcement publicly announced that they had a suspect. You know, I actually remember that day. Do you remember that day, Brian? Just curious. Uh, actually, I don't. Oh. Well, I remember that day because uh, this was, I want to say it was maybe a family member's birthday or a Sunday dinner at my grandmother's house. And it was on, like, her television. That's what I remember. Yeah, I actually, I actually don't remember the day. Oh, well. Well, you don't have true crime brain. <laughs> <laughs> so the they, when they issued the warrant it was for the first degree murder and the killing of Carrie Lynn Yoder when Derek Todd Lee realized that the net was closing in he fled to Atlanta, Georgia but due to the public's help he was arrested on May the 27th 2003 at the motel he was staying in after the arrest blood was drawn from Derek Todd Lee for further DNA testing. The Louisiana State Police Crime Lab analyzed the blood drawn and determined that the likelihood of randomly finding another individual with the same genetic pro profile was 1 in 3.6 quadrillion. Well, that, I think that means they got it right. Yes. Uh, now, quadrillion, that's so, like, there's, like, billion and then, is there, like, trillion and then quadrillion? Is that how it works? I'm not sure. I think that, wait, well, it comes after a trillion, right? I think so, because quad is four. Uh, so, if it's quadrillion, then that would mean, I think, I think what that would mean is that there would have to be twice the amount of people on this planet, roughly. Yeah, it's a it's a figure that's uh, higher than the national debt. Mm. Well, we should be happy about that, I suppose. Yeah. On March 31st of 2004, the district court ruled the murders of Gina Wilson Green, Pamela Piglia Kinmore, Trinisha Danae Colomb, and Carrie Yoder, as well as the attempted rape and murder of Diane Alexander, were admissible with the other crimes. So that means that 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 all of these cases are like kind of tried alongside each other. Is that what that means? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or simultaneously, right? I think. Yeah, that's concurrent, what I meant. Yeah. Yes, concurrent. Yes. On August tenth, two thousand four, Derek Todley was convicted of the second degree murder of Geraldine De Soto. And this carried an automatic life sentence in prison for him. Then on October the 12th of 2004, he was found guilty of murdering Charlotte Murray Pace by a separate jury. Jurors returned their unanimous decision just an hour and 20 minutes later, and Lee was sentenced to death by the same jury two days later. In 2015, the Louisiana Supreme Court denied his appeal to overturn the first-degree murder conviction and death sentence. Justice Scott Crichton wrote in the decision that evidence showing how Lee killed Charlotte Murray Pace was in such a brutal and vicious manner that was overwhelming and horrific. So this is the kind of thing where you... Not even a judge is going to look at that and say, oh, yeah, you, you totally get to just live your life. Yeah, this, this is not, um, this is far from the, I guess you could say the normal kind of case that comes into this judge's courtroom. Uh, just keep in mind, violent offenders are the smallest number of criminal offenders. You know, most, most criminal offenders... Are, are there for blue-collar crimes or property crimes, uh, infractions of law. Uh, very few offenders are violent offenders, so this, this is far from the usual case that, you know, graces this courtroom's presence. Right. But 
uh, natural causes got to Derek Todd Lee before the system did. On January 21st, 2016, he died shortly before 9 a.m. while receiving medical care at a Baton Rouge hospital, and he was 47 years old. So, that was pretty much, you know, not a long life, but the time that he had in his life, he did not do good things. No, and he didn't even make it into his 50s, let alone make it out of his 50s. Whereas it's said that if a man can make it out of his 50s, chances are he's going to, you know, live, live, live a bit after that. Well, he didn't make it past his 50s. And he would probably still be sitting on death row right now. Yeah, yeah, he probably would. Tony Clayton and John Sinquefeld were the prosecutors who tried Derek Todd Lee. Tony Clayton's case is what secured Lee's life sentence, and Sinquefeld's case is what got Lee the death penalty. Tony Clayton said that Geraldine DeSoto's murder was the worst crime scene he had ever looked at. He also said that when I saw him in the courtroom and we had begun the trial, I have to say that it was a chilling effect. First thing I thought when I saw him was, I'm looking at a real live predator. Yeah. I mean, you can... Someone who is a a psychotic serial killer... You you can look at them, and you can see it. You can see it on their face, especially when they're being confronted for it. Right, exactly. And after Derek Todley passed away, Tony Clayton said that the eerie part about this whole thing is now he's dead, and he left here without explaining to, to these folks why. And there are are a whole bunch of bodies out there that he could have given some closure to victims' families about. And he did not do that. In a sense, he won. He left out of here. He did not show any remorse. And now he's gone, and there will always be questions. I, I question anyone looking for remorse from... Uh, a serial killer. Who it just, just doesn't happen. They're no, not sorry. Who, in, who just, they're doing what they enjoy doing. Okay? So, they're not going to have any remorse. And typically, you look into their face, it's going to be, it's going to be vacant. Right. Of, of any, of any real expression. Uh, in, in a sense, they're radicalized. Their sense of reality is warped and intended to service themselves. You know, to them, to them, they are the, they are the world. Right. The world is them. The world revolves around them, and they don't really they don't care about anyone but but themselves. Exactly. So they're not going to show remorse. They're not sorry. They and, don't and they, care. And they can't tell you why. The reason why they can't tell you why, I mean, just like, for example, like, um, yes, okay, sitting in the gaming shop, okay, okay, all right, am I going to get into a big, long explanation as to, say, why I enjoy, um, uh, let's say, uh, playing Magic the Gathering, collectible card game? Uh, please don't. No, no, I'm not. Nobody is. Nobody's sitting in there. As you're just sitting in there to play, nobody cares about why you're there. No one's going to explain to each other why you're there. Oh, okay. okay. I, I because, see where you're going with that. All right. Because everybody, everybody knows why you're there. You're there because you just wanted to play. Well, guess what? He's in that courtroom on trial for murder. He's convicted for murder. Why? Because he wanted to kill. He enjoyed killing people. Pure and simple. And he doesn't feel like he has to explain this to anybody. Or even justify it. Because in his mind, in his mind, he's right. He's okay. He had no business in that, that mind. He's, he's had no business being in that courtroom. Mm, so, yeah. just the same. Having an honest conversation with a serial killer like him is like try, is worse than trying to have an honest conversation with a troll online. It's not going to happen. 
Good point. Good point. Yeah. You know, you can't expect this person to acknowledge what they are and have a reasonable conversation with you because because we're going back to the principle of the reasonable person in criminal justice. This person is not a reasonable person. This person is on trial for murder because he's not a reasonable person. He would not have committed murder if he was a reasonable person. And of course, this is why you can't get a convicted felon to sit on a jury. Okay. Oh, this is the yeah. whole reason why. Because a convicted felon is not necessarily is not a legal per a reasonable person by definition, you know, as defined in a court of law. Because it's someone who's been convicted or pled guilty to breaking the law, so you can't have them sit on a jury to, you know, judge someone who's suspected of doing of breaking the law. Because legally they're not a reasonable person. Okay, good good explanation. Okay, reasonable people don't break the law on the felony level. I'm going to say reasonable people don't break the law on the felony level or worse. Okay. <laughs> good explanation. And while you, you said that you were not going to go into an explanation why you like Magic the Gathering, you did a misdirect and went to a long explanation about why these people do not show remorse. It is because, like you said, they enjoy it. So good misdirect, Brian. Maybe you should have been an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> now, before the murder trial of Charlotte Murray Pace, the prosecutor for that case, Sinquefeld, said that there's been a lot of hype, there's been a lot of talk, and now it's time to play ball. After getting the guilty verdict, Sinquefeld said this is insurance with the case across the river that he will never be able to get out again and terrorize the citizens of South Louisiana. I remember every single day of that case and I'll remember it for the rest of my life. I felt a huge responsibility. At one time there were 600,000 people in South Louisiana that were terrified by the actions of this man. Sinquefeld had spent more than 40 years as a prosecutor, and this is the case that he remembers the most, and he rates it right as the top of his career. He also said, as far as the death penalty portion, believe it or not, the outcome was not as certain as a lot of people might believe. I hope it gives closure to the victim's family members, but it also allows me to finally close the case of the South Louisiana serial killer. During the trial for Charlotte Murray Pace, Sinquefeld presented, presented damaging evidence that linked the killings. The phone cord that was cut from Diane Alexander's home was found 450 feet from Pam Kindermore's body a week later. The night that Carrie Lynn Yoder disappeared, cell phone records put Lee near Whiskey Bay where her body had been found. The telephones were missing from some of the crime scenes, and it is believed that Derek Todley took keys as trophies. Yeah. yeah. Souvenirs. Yeah. 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 Nasty. The yeah, they'll, they'll do that. Um, yes, they will. I brought home a couple of souvenirs, although... The, the, <laughs> well, one was, uh, one was a periscope as used to peek out the top of... Uh, an Iraqi tank. Okay, well that that's a different kind of souvenir. Yeah, a different kind of souvenir. And I got to lounge around uh, inside an Iraqi, I believe it was a T-62. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. I mean, talk about steel. You know, right, you're tapping, right. you're inside, you're tapping on that the interior of that steel that makes a tank, and it's like, wow. I mean, talk about a thick piece of steel. So the prosecution also reminded the jury that Lee had told Diane Alexander, I've been watching you. He did not just pick the victims out of the sky. He watched and he waited. Diane Alexander gave testimony during the trial and identified her attacker in the courtroom without hesitation. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. I know. Don't you love it when a case is solid? Yeah, that these these are the kind of cases that the death penalty is perfect for. Yeah, it's, my only reservation against the death penalty is that the state should not have that power. 
Well, that that that's my biggest. If the person there, there's sometimes a possibility that the person was wrongfully convicted. Right. But Derek Todley is not one of those examples. No, he is not one of those examples. You're correct. He's an example of someone who's guilty of sin. You know, the the prosecution also reminded the jury that if Diane's son had not walked in on the attack, jurors would have seen photos of her, photos of her, like the bodies they saw of the five slain women, and they showed pictures of their dead, naked bodies. Instead, Sinquefeld said, they saw Alexander on the witness stand, identifying Lee as the man who pretended to be lost on her doorstep in Bro Bridge one sunny afternoon and then barge into her home. Did you watch her when she identified him? Did you watch her face? I hope you did. She stared at him. She didn't take her eyes off of him. She didn't have any hesitation. She did not have any doubt. Well, I I really am enjoying reading a a prosecutor's arguments. Because, you know, people have to remember that no matter if it's defense or prosecution, they have to paint the best picture of, of the sequence of events. Yeah, and, the, and the, ideal, the ideal situation is that the prosecutor and the defense attorney both do a credible job to the utmost of their abilities so that the truth can be found in the middle, right? Right. That is the way our criminal justice system has to work. It can't be tipped too far one way or the other or you open the possibility of innocent people going to jail. Exactly. Kind of like in Russia where the public defenders in any jurisdiction in Russia, the public defender's office is actually uh, in cahoots with the prosecu- with the prosecutors. Interesting. In fact, in jurisdiction, t- your typical jurisdiction in Russia, especially you know Saint Petersburg, okay, as well as Moscow, the uh, the prosecutors have the business cards of public defenders who they work with, and they readily hand them out to defendants. Mm, okay. And these these defense attorneys will essentially do will essentially lay down and not challenge anything brought into evidence and simply just try to steer their client towards a guilty plea. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Which means it, it, it's kind of like uh, asking a used car salesman to represent your best interest when you're trying to buy a car. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, no offense yeah. to any used car salesman yeah. who might listen to our show. Yeah, and if, if we you, we know you got to earn a living too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the uh, uh, the what? And for high profile. High-profile trials, the judge is typically in contact with Vladimir Putin himself. Oh yeah. Whereas Putin, Putin will tell the judge what the desired outcome is. If you hire outside can- counsel, uh, your outside counsel will get stonewalled and be forced to wait for hours on end to see you, if they even get to see you. And this is why I just need to, again, remind people that these rights that we have in our country when when you're arrested I, be, I believe it isn't the fourth amendment that uh, you cannot just be hauled off to jail they can't just bust into your house and look for evidence without a warrant uh, your Miranda rights your right to an attorney all these things are important and just because you don't like bad people who do these things who go to jail or get convicted of a crime or whatever remember that these rights also apply to you innocent people get arrested quite often and if you are an innocent person who gets arrested you're going to be damn glad that you have those rights oh yes okay just making a point 
Sinkwefeld also said that the evidence indicated that Charlotte Murray Pace fought Lee from room to room all over her house. Remember in the last episode, it was uh, evidence that she was the one who fought back the hardest, and that's what they meant. Yes, and that that's one reason why it's important to fight back, because even if you do lose, you can leave evidence. Do not comply. If somebody breaks into your house or tries to get you in a car or something, do not comply. I mean, it's it's probably better, like, a, you know, for you to try to attract some attention. You know, even if they have a gun on you, if you can, like, kind of move out of the path of the gun a little bit and cause a gunshot to go off, that can get people's attention. Yes, and, and, and as you... Now, as part of my... As part of the tactical training I've had, okay... Uh, let's say you're outside, you're in the open, and someone's presenting a gun in your direction where you execute what's called a rollout, a diagonal diagonal movement as you're drawing your pistol to make yourself more difficult to shoot. Okay? Because you're going to make this typically untrained uh, psychopath shoot at a moving target, and then if you're carrying concealed, the next thing that happens is... Uh, see how well he performs under fire from you, okay? Right. But what's very important when you're facing, when you're trying to create distance or, or move away from someone with a gun, rolling out in a diagonal direction is important because you, if you're moving when someone's trying to shoot at you, you are drastically decreasing your chances of being hit by gunfire. Exactly. Versus just you know. standing there. I mean, in, okay. a, in a perfect world, everyone would be able to escape from these situations. But unfortunately, it is not a perfect world. And there are plenty of people who do die, even if they fight. But, you know, the important thing is that you fight. Yes, yes. You, you as they say, you don't want to go down without a fight. Because... There are situations where a fight is the only chance you have to survive or escape. Yes. And ple- pleading for your life... Isn't going to make a damn bit of difference. In fact, pleading for your life, what that will do is give a psychopath pleasure. Okay? Don't give them anything. There's only one possible conceivable reason I can think of to plead for your life with a psychopath, and that is possibly to buy you a few seconds. Okay. To do to yeah. do something. If say you're there's obstructions in your way, and you need to buy yourself some time, pleading for your life can 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 possibly buy you that time. Because then you're you're giving him something. You're giving him something he wants without harming yourself in that moment. So it may give you time to do something else. But but it but your plan can't be just sit there and plead for your life because it's not going to work. They're not once once they've gained once they they're uh they finished enjoying listening to your uh pleas for mercy. Her her your your in their mind pathetic pleas for mercy. Once they've finished that dopamine high they're going to move on to the next dopamine high, which is going to be harming you and killing you. Yeah, it's interesting. You kind of just described that as like a drug addiction. Yeah. Mm. No, that that's there. There are you know hormones that the serial killers are addicted to, mm. and yeah. harming people and killing people is how they get these. It lights up the, these highs. It lights up the pleasure centers of their brain. Yeah, you know, most people don't gain pleasure from doing that kind of stuff. It, it, it's, a, it's a small part of the population that, unfortunately, we have to watch out for. But, you know, because Charlotte fought him from room to room, and even though she did lose her life, ultimately it was Derek Todley who did lose that fight. Because she trapped his DNA on her body. And he didn't get away with it. No, no. So, so she created evidence during her fight. Yes, she did. And Sinquefeld used his final words to remind jurors of the women of the women attacked by Lee: Charlotte Murray Pace, Carrie Lynn Yoder, Gina Green, Pam Kinnamore, 
Trinesha Dene Colomb, and Diane Alexander. He also asked the jury to look at what the slain women had in common. He said, they bought beauty to sometimes an ugly world, but this beauty was also their downfall because it attracted Lee, a sexual predator who killed them for a few minutes of sexual gratification. And ultimately, it was the DNA evidence that won the case. The DNA is Derek Todley's profile, Sinkwefeld said. He reminded jurors that experts had testified it and that they made a 1 in 3.6 quadrillion chance that Lee had not committed the crimes. He can't run. He can't hide. He left it there. He committed these rapes. He committed these murders. He's guilty. When the jury returned the verdict, Charlotte's mother, Anne, shook and trembled and she squeezed the hands of the loved ones at her side. She closed her eyes and began to cry. She described the legal proceedings as a journey of 1,000 miles. She said that there is evil in this world and Derek Todd Lee is the personification of that. After the verdict, the families embraced each other and repeated, justice for Murray, justice for all. We feel that justice has been served, said, said Linda Yoder. The sad part is that none of these women will be back in our lives again. And that is pretty much it. That is the case of Derek Todd Lee. Uh, from how they initially got the, 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 the profile wrong, to the, de to the evidence timeline, to how they caught him, the trial, and then ultimately his death. Open and shut case. Well, you know, if they would have initially listened to those women who said, oh, that there was a black guy watching Charlotte's house. Here, look, we even made a composite sketch. Maybe if they would have compared that to Diane Alexander's sketch because they had that. And, well, they, and they were being descriptive. Yeah. Yes, they were. They, they, were they, they weren't trying to be racist. No, no. If it, if it would have been... A white, a white guy, or if it would have been, let's say, an a Eskimo. Or a Spanish guy. Right. Or that they would have said that. Right. But, you know, that's, you know, that, that's the thing, though. This is another, another instance of where police are not listening to witnesses and getting it wrong for a while. You know, some of these women would have still been alive. It it is, is very possible, likely you know. if authorities would have gotten him sooner. And that's, you see, homicide detectives, they understand all too well that they're working against the clock. That, set, that, that Hollywood cliche, uh, quote, uh, he's killed before and he'll kill again. Well, it's true. Right. It's because they enjoy killing people. So... Either they have to die or someone has to take them off the street. Well, it's like the first, uh, you know, the, there's that show, The First 48. Because the first 48 hours of the aftermath of a crime or a disappearance is crucial. That's your most precious window. And I wonder what would have happened if, within the first 48 hours, if they would have listened to some witnesses. They might have actually saved some lives. They might have. Yeah. It's a possibility. Just saying. Law enforcement dropped the ball on this one in the beginning. And, you know, even though, to, to me, even though Derek Todley is gone and he was found guilty and all these other things, I don't feel any great satisfaction at the outcome of this because ultimately people died at his hands. And that is what happens when good men do nothing. Okay. I mean, yeah. men, men yes. isn't people in general. People suffer when good people do nothing. Which is why most good people generally feel an obligation to act if something is wrong. 
Yes. Because and the consequences of inaction can be just as bad as the consequences of actually doing something bad. Right. And, you know, there's been, uh, you know, true crime aficionados will know what I'm talking about when I say that there have been instances in, in this, in life, where somebody's gut feeling has helped save somebody else or has helped save themselves. You know, your gut feeling, if you think something's wrong, it is. I will argue with anybody who says that who says otherwise because I really think that we forget we're on top of the food chain but we're still animals and we still have a gut instinct that tells us when something is off yes your, your, your perception of everyday life itself is going to tell you when something's not right when something's odd yes and listen to your gut like if you're walking at home walking home at night and you think oh well if I take the shortcut I'll get home three minutes faster but your gut instinct tells you nah let, let's go the let's go the long way go the long way guys don't go into that dark alley yeah exactly take take the safe route take the safe route exactly now Next week's episode is going to be our monthly deep dive into a crime that has taken place in the southern United States. We will be turning our attention to one of my favorite types of stories, a doomed love story. It originates in Alabama, and this is a, going to be yet another instance where somebody has probably ignored their gut instinct and got into a lot of trouble because of it. Yes, it, with, with, when your spidey sense tingles, don't ignore it, don't disregard it. Exactly. Unless, of course, you're trying to save someone's life. You or know, at you, the very with, least, you know, call at the very least call the cops. Yeah, yeah. If now if you have to put your fear aside, okay, to help someone who's in danger, okay. And you're capable of providing this help, you should do it. By any means possible. Yes. You like there's a but there was a I forgot which case it was exactly because you know after a while when you watch uh, enough true crime documentaries that kind of blend together, but there was a particular instance where somebody I think it was a girl she was being held in a trunk she was being kidnapped. And she made enough noise to where somebody who was like driving past that car heard her, followed the car while staying on the phone with emergency services. You know, stuff like that. Just be, you know, observant. If you think that, that there's something wrong, there might be. And you know what? If you got to call the cops and, and if you were wrong, just deal with the embarrassment, okay? Yeah. I'm, and, 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 you know, I mean... There's there's times and there's going to be times where something is not what you thought it was, and then you just feel a little embarrassed. Well, so what? You get over that. You forget about that. Yeah, and you might even laugh about it a few years later. Yeah, I'm, I I'll give you like one small example, okay? Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Department unit in the parking garage next to Target in Metairie, okay? Uh, Jeff the unit is a police unit, or you know, vehicle patrol car that had his engine running and had a door open okay and I looked around I didn't see a deputy so what did they do I went ahead and called it in and I even waited and a deputy came and he just shrugged his head and he said oh, okay someone was you know this unit doesn't uh, isn't used much so someone was charging the battery and then just left it didn't come back Ah, okay. But, you know, it was because I contacted Jefferson Parish that someone up to no good didn't get to jump into that police car and drive off in it. Right. Or maybe that wouldn't have happened. But, you know, I decided to call it in. Better safe than sorry. Right, better safe than sorry to yeah, make sure that that sorry. wasn't going to happen. You know, for example. Yes. All right, dear listeners, until next week, be safe, be kind. Remember that we're all human beings. And don't park next to vans.
If it's dark, it's dangerous, and your spidey sense is going off, leave immediately. In fact, don't be there in the first place. Be discreet. Take an extra minute or two or a few minutes to to take this to go the safe way instead of taking a shortcut that can get you harmed or killed. And if you are speaking to law enforcement in a professional capacity and you're not the witness or the victim to a crime, lawyer up. <laughs>